Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Bruce Perry and this is the third session of the Child Trauma Academy's seven slide series. Today's presentation is focusing on the variety of response capabilities that we have when we are faced with threat. Most of us have heard of the fight or flight response and uh, it is one of the most important forms of response to threat, but it's not the only one. So let's back up a second and, and talk a little bit about how your brain is continually receiving input from the outside world and from the inside world. And this input is processed and then acted on. And during that, multi-dimensional processing. Uh, the incoming information is assessed and appropriate responses are made to keep you in equilibrium and to keep you alive. So as your brain is monitoring internal signals like the amount of oxygen and external signals like the relational milieu, you're essentially getting input that will help you decide whether or not you're safe or whether you're threatened. And if you feel threatened, there will be a variety of adaptations, of a variety of immediate responses that you can recruit to help you stay alive. And many of these you're familiar with. Everybody in this field has heard about cortisol. Cortisol is one of the many chemicals uh, involved in keeping you in equilibrium. There are central nervous system mechanisms that involve norepinephrine and most of these originate here in the locus ceruleus and the, these neurons send distributions through multiple parts of the brain allowing you to recruit and orchestrate functioning across a, a diverse range of systems in the brain. All of this together allows you to have a very flexible and very complex adaptive response to stress and threat. In general, you can classify these capabilities into two broad continuum. One continuum is the classic fight or flight continuum. We refer to this as the hyper arousal continuum or the arousal continuum. Some of the important neurochemicals involved in that involve are norepinephrine, dopamine. You've heard of all of these. And if you look at the other major continuum, it's the dissociative continuum. And it involves some similar and complementing neurochemical systems. Uh, but they're a little bit different. And the point is that these two different big response capabilities exist on a spectrum. They can coexist and can be mutually recruited uh, if necessary when a human being is under threat. So essentially what you need to remember from today's presentation is that there's a heterogeneity in the threat response. And the hyperarousal response again uh, is preparing you basically to flee or to fight. And this means you get your body ready uh, to run away or fight. You, you increase your muscle tone, your heart rate goes up, you quit focusing on anything internal. Uh, it doesn't matter if you have a sore leg or a full bladder. What really matters is what's going on outside. And so you become externalizing and you become activated. The dissociative Adaptation, however, is used when your brain gets signals that say that, you know what, you're really under threat in a way that you aren't going to be able to run away from. And so if you have immobilizing or inescapable threat, and an example might be a young child in a domestic violence situation, uh, your brain essentially prepares you to be injured and to protect you from the inescapable pain of the external world. And so you withdraw from the external world, you disengage, and you internalize. And this involves a different physiological response. If you're dissociating, you get signals to decrease your heart rate, to decrease peripheral circulation, to decrease your eye blink rate. And it, there are 
different ways in which one or the other response can be used, or more commonly, they can be used together. Some of the common signs and symptoms that go along with dissociation involve avoidance and numbing and overcompliance, a sense of uh, derealization, and you, you feel like you're watching things happen to you. This is where the kind of robotic, uh, non-emotional responses can be seen sometimes. And it's also one of the very common uh, presentations in profound dissociation is uh, hearing voices and hallucinatory phenomena that get these individuals frequently mislabeled as having some kind of psychotic disorder. We will talk more about that in future sessions. Now the more common set of signs and symptoms that people are familiar with around trauma are, involve this hyper arousal continuum. So this hypervigilance and impulsivity and high resting heart rates and the things that go with externalizing behaviors. In general, there are different factors that will determine what the balance is between a dissociative and arousal response. Uh, if you are an adult and you have the ability to fight and flee and you are in a situation that is escapable, you can use that fight or flight response. Uh, in contrast, if you're an infant and you uh, are unable to fight or flee, you use uh, the infant's equivalent of that response, which is to cry and hope that somebody will come and fight for you or flee with you. But if that doesn't happen, you will dissociate. And th these are very protective. So depending upon your gender, depending upon the nature of the trauma, depending upon the your developmental age, you will have a different tendency to use this combination of adaptive styles differently. Now, the other thing that's very important is to remember that in any given traumatic experience, different people are going to have different ways of responding. And as an introduction to this concept, let me sh walk you through this three-dimensional image. And so here's time, the axis of time. The traumatic event takes place over a period of time. Now, it may be minutes, it may be hours, it may be weeks. But everybody has a different set of adaptive capabilities and strengths. And so I'm just giving you two examples here. One is the red set of red dots. The other one is the set of blue dots. The person who uses who is the blue dot person in the face of threat will have a little bit of an arousal response. They'll go up the arousal continuum about halfway, but they essentially go all the way back to the end of this dissociative continuum here. And during the whole duration of the traumatic event, they're profoundly dissociated. And then when the event is over, as it begins to end, they start to experience arousal and the anxiety associated with arousal. But during the event, they were numb and, and, and disengaged. Now, the, in, the red individual has a different baseline level of arousal and in the face of threat has this extreme arousal response. And so they go to this high arousal response, but they, over time, also dissociate to some degree. So even though this individual is both dissociating, we can see that he's partway down this dissociative continuum, at least halfway down, and, but he's almost all the way up the arousal continuum. And so you see that this individual, these two end up at the same point at the end of the event where they're both partially tuned up and anxious and partially dissociated. But they got to that same point through a completely different trajectory. And this is something that you'll see if you ever spend time with individuals who share a common traumatic event. Different response patterns uh, and different trajectories which will, as we'll talk about in future sessions, result in different presentations for physical signs, symptoms, uh, cognitive recollection, and so forth. The interesting thing is it, both of these individuals went through the exact same event, 
but because of their different states of arousal during the event, they'll have completely different recollection about what happened. The person who's blue will remember some details of the event that the person in red does not remember, and the person in red will remember some things that the person in blue will not remember at all. And this leads to this very spotty form of traumatic recollection of, of events. And again, we'll talk more about that when we talk about traumatic memory in future sessions. So for today, I just want you to remember the remarkable flexibility of a, a, an individual's capacity to respond to threat, that there's remarkable heterogeneity. Not everybody responds the same. And again, this complexity in response capability and the superimposition of that with the complexity of individual experiences during development leads necessarily to a very complex set of physical, emotional, social, and cognitive consequences that will result from developmental trauma. And again, this is part of the challenge of our field uh, and part of the richness of our field at the same time. Thank you for listening. Uh, those of you who would like more information about the Child Trauma Academy, please feel free to visit our website and to keep following us on this seven slide series as we continue to provide information that we think can help you in your work. Thank you.